He's been blind for almost 20 years, but he's never given up hope he'd see again. Darkness is perhaps one of the most inhumane ways to treat a person. The sub-miniature TV camera... In a for more than 30 years, this man has been obsessed with making the blind see. He's invented a radical device, and he needs willing blind people to help him perfect it. What you're seeing here is the beginning of the end of blindness. Yet U.S. regulators fear it's not safe, and they've banned it. I am prepared for the risks of innovation. But other researchers believe they can do it better and more safely. I don't think it's quite so important to be first. Being best is what's going to really matter. Wherever he goes, he turns heads. Jens is known as Patient Alpha, the first person in the world with a workable artificial vision system. He has a cyborg-like technology implanted directly in his brain. He is here in Lisbon, Portugal, working with the doctors who developed and installed his system. After two decades in the dark, Jens can now see enough to discern outlines and shapes. Once being seated, I was able to see the building beside me. Lisbon means something to me now. It never meant anything before because it was just a dark void. When you're totally blind, the world is a void. Better watch it, Tony. Don't trip over that. Jens has never accepted his blindness. He has spent half his life in an obsessive search to find a way out of the dark. The sidewalk here? Actually, I know. He's a classical pianist who has committed entire scores to memory. He splits 200 cords of firewood every winter on his farm. He's an electronics wizard. I use the sound a lot when I do this because when the solder melts, it squeaks. It has to be hot enough or it doesn't work. I'm completely disconnected from Ontario Hydro. He built his own solar and wind power system. From solar cells and wind turbines, I'm actually uh, able to power our house. But none of it fulfilled him. I never intended to give anybody the impression that what I'm doing is making me happy. I, I can't see what I'm doing. I can split all the firewood I want. I can't stand back and see what I've done. I built my own hydro station, but I turn on the light and it's still dark. Jens has been in the dark for 20 years. He was still a teenager when fate dealt him two tragic blows. The loss of my sight was entirely through terrible, terrible luck. It was totally unforeseen. Uh, when I was first working at the railway, I was 17, I was a section man, and I accidentally hit the top of the rail with a pick. It's a small piece of metal, the size of perhaps a button on my shirt flew off into my left eye. That eye was totally destroyed. Undaunted, Jens quickly learned to rely on his remaining eye and continued to live a life of adventure until inexplicably lightning struck twice. And when I was 20 years old, a piece of metal flew off a snowmobile clutch into my right eye. I lost my other eye. Jens was now totally blind. Angry, cursed, you, you can put it this way, but you best basically feel Dis, uh, disillusion with uh, the, the future. I mean, I had a child who was two months old and a good wife, and then suddenly this all fell on them as well as it fell on myself. The life he'd just begun to explore was shelved forever. I was a motorcycle freak, and I had a good job. And I had a nice hunting rifle I liked to go out and target shoot with. I had to give all that up, along with even the simplest of pleasures. Still, he pressed on. Laurie and I both diligently started to re-educate ourselves. My wife got herself a job teaching music, 
and I got myself private work in tuning and repairing pianos. Jens and his wife Laurie were so successful in their music business, they were able to buy a farm in rural Ontario. They now have eight children, six of whom Jens delivered himself. But for all of his success as a blind person, Jens had never given up hope that one day he'd see again. I just could not survive in the darkness and consider it a good life. I could heal from a lot of wounds, but this one I just couldn't. Jens spent all his spare time searching for a way out of the dark. He scanned the internet using computer devices designed to assist the blind. Then one day, a friend suggested he log on to a website, artificialvision.com. It was the home page of the DeBell Institute, a private research facility in New York City that was developing a high-tech cure for blindness. Founder William DeBell had spent 30 years designing and testing a revolutionary new artificial vision system that was something right out of Star Trek. DeBell's system uses a tiny camera mounted on a set of glasses. The camera sends video signals via a computer worn on a belt to electrodes inserted in the brain. When stimulated, those electrodes produce a rudimentary form of vision. That answered my prayers that there would actually be a system out that makes a person see instead of just use another one of the senses that you already have. Intrigued by the technology, Jens contacted the DeBell Institute in New York, a move that would change his life. Jens was considered an ideal candidate to be the very first to try the new artificial vision system. Electrodes would be implanted in his brain in a radical and costly procedure considered so experimental that regulators in the U.S. refused to allow it on humans. Jens was willing to take the risk. His wife, Lori, was equally determined. She actually mentioned, oh, well, if we have to sell the house, we'll sell the house. And she has a nice grand piano she worked very hard to keep because it was part of her uh, income that she paid, paid for it. And, uh, she was going to sell that. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for coming out tonight. To raise money, Jens performed at a series of concerts around his hometown, till finally they had the more than $100,000 needed for the operation. The operation was to be performed across the Atlantic in Lisbon, Portugal, home to the branch office of William de Bell's Institute, far away from US regulators. In April 2002, Jens and Lori arrived, full of hope, prepared to undergo the brain implant. Lori recorded their trip on home video. I really don't have any choice. If I ran over to the airplane now and took off and went home, I think I'd disappoint a lot of people. Um, I just got to go through with it. It was a Sunday night, April 7th. Monday on, uh, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that's 22 hours from now, I get, uh, I get the operation. So, uh, well, all my concerns, all my fears are behind me and it's onwards and upwards, I think. If it works, Jens will be the first blind person in the world to have a workable artificial vision system implanted in his brain. The apprehension I had regarding this was lost a long time ago when it came over my fear of using the white cane out in the street. There was a, a lot more fear there than there ever was even being wheeled into the operating room. He's willing to be a human guinea pig because he longs for a life most of us take for granted. The first thing I want to do is see my kids. I really wanted to do things with them. 
They wanted me to go out bicycling with them, to go out hiking with them, or when we go traveling, that I can share the same world with them. I mean, how do you have fun with a bunch of children and a good wife when you yourself are stuck in the darkness? William DeBell wants to change the lives of the blind. He's a researcher and an inventor, considered a maverick by his peers. He has devoted the last 30 years to perfecting an artificial vision system. What we plan to do is first have the artificial heart implanted in the chest. There is a rotating... DeBell was inspired by one of the great pioneers in artificial organ development, Dr. Wilhelm Kolff. As a graduate student at the University of Utah, DeBell worked under Dr. Kolff on an artificial heart and a cochlear implant before turning his attention to artificial vision. DeBell's own father enthusiastically endorsed the idea. Dr. Martin DeBell was also one of the early pioneers in artificial body parts, like the artificial hip. I mean, these, these gentlemen were inventors. His education began at an early age at his father's side. He was my first mentor. I mean, I started working with him when I was eight years old. I mean, some of it was pretty tough. When I got to be a little older, I mean, I was in the OR when he was doing amputations and everything else. I got to hold the toes and you put your hand on the calf and you manipulated the leg and then took it away. It was his father who gave him the drive to pursue seemingly impossible goals. I have a very strong sense of mission, but it isn't guided by a belief in God. I mean, it's sort of a family tradition. You try the hardest thing that you think that you can possibly do. In 1969, while working on his PhD in physiology, William DeBell wrote a daring proposal. It got dubbed the world's greatest unread proposal. Everything, including the computer science, the simulation, everything is in that book. He proposed a prototype that would circumvent the eyes and electrically stimulate the brain to make the subject see spots of light called phosphenes. This would be the first step to using a video signal to generate phosphenes in shapes and outlines, creating a crude form of sight. Our first stimulation involved a stimulator about the size of a bread box, and it drove a single electrode. The first cases that were done were all done on patients who had to have craniotomies for other reasons. Even as a student, DeBell had grand ambitions. Eventually, what we hope to get to on the visual prosthesis it's a sub-miniature TV camera in a glass eye in the eye socket. Connected As a young neurophysiologist, DeBell proved he was prepared to go to extremes to realize his ambition. ...connected with internal circuitry to electrodes on the surface of the visual cortex. In 1977, when we were looking at retinal implants for artificial vision, we implanted myself right up to self-experimentation. That's a standard of the field. 39 electrodes into the barrel. Bell spent the next decade right. testing the viability of a permanent brain implant. We'll have a little bigger pedestal, and then we can do all 64 electrodes on a permanent pedestal and blind go into. He needed to know the implants wouldn't cause infection or be rejected by the body. We tested this in several hundred animals, primarily cats, and then when we went to human implants, we did two patients who, as of today, still have those implants uh, intact 25 years later. Next, DeBell experimented with the number and size of the implanted electrodes. But in 1978, all testing came to a halt. Concerned for patient safety, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration banned testing of visual implants in human beings. Jerry, a volunteer from New York, was one of the two people already implanted just before the ban. He was implanted on one side of his brain with only 17 electrodes. Results were mixed. Jerry never had any problem with infection, but he never got usable vision. We did not have the computer power to really drive it. 
But for DeBell, the success of Jerry's implant is its longevity. Well, there's been no side effects. He's had no infections. He's had no epilepsy. The phosphines have not changed in threshold. It's been a perfectly stable implant. To raise more money to perfect his artificial vision research, DeBell developed and marketed other medical devices through his own company. He formed the DeBell Institute in 1984. His company designed, patented, and sold everything from breathing pacemakers to hiccup suppressors. He refused to apply for grants because he didn't want any strings attached. DeBell wanted to completely control the process. It's just a lot more freedom. <laughs> look at where I am and look at where other people are and that answers your question. But to stay ahead of the pack, he played by his own rules, risks and all. You can't be positive. I'm telling you, you're on the cutting edge. You can't be positive of anything. How could the people in the uh, Challenger, you know, decide that they were perfectly safe? They weren't. Lisbon, Portugal. Now, at age 61, DeBell still presses on with his obsession, despite suffering complications from diabetes that resulted in amputation of his right leg. Here, at his branch office, it's a big day. DeBell is readying Jens for what they hope will be the implantation of the first functional artificial vision system. Jens will be patient alpha. It's a procedure that's not allowed in the US, but is sanctioned here in Portugal. It takes four hours. DeBell doesn't perform the surgery. He's not a medical doctor. I'm just sitting here waiting for Jens to come back. Um, the surgery went really well. Jens begins the painful process of recovery. This is Jens's head just after he's been out here. You got the one shaped up. A very big headache. Yeah, a very big headache. Now he's getting bandaged up. Yeah. Looks a little bit like Frankenstein. Jens now has two plates of approximately 70 electrodes implanted on top of his visual cortex. There are two holes on either side of his head for plugs that will connect cables to a video camera and a portable computer. A week after surgery, technicians hook up Jens' electrode implants to a computer. If the electrodes work, he should see spots of light called phosphines. One by one, technicians stimulate each of the electrodes. Jens has waited half a lifetime for this moment. Now? And the very first time I was given the stimulation on the lowest setting, I saw the little dot. The light even had some color in it. And I would have been happy just to look at the phosphines for a while. In fact, I regretted having the testing over with because this was the first time I actually saw real color and light for the longest, longest time. Next, the technicians create a map that captures exactly where Yen sees phosphines in his visual field. Matching each phosphine to an electrode is the first step towards organizing the phosphines into usable patterns. For Jens, it was a step towards danger. Do you have the, the technicians allowed him to control the current himself, something that would likely not be allowed in a government-approved trial. I insisted, and uh, they taught me how to run the program for that. And I was basically doing the mapping as if it was a uh, little arcade game, and it was so much fun. That fun ended abruptly. With control of the device in his own hands and so excited at seeing the phosphines, Jens ramped up the current, triggering an unexpected seizure. At one time, I actually did temporarily lose consciousness, but um, that was just a minor issue, and uh, we were a little more careful after that. But I couldn't help it. It was just so, so pretty to see these little dots flying across your visual field. It's very strange walking without the cane for the first time. 
Okay, there's an obstruction right in front of me. In June of 2002, two months after the surgery, DeBell takes Jens to New York City to present him as patient Alpha and to demonstrate his implant system at a meeting of artificial organ researchers. His announcement makes headlines. To publicize the achievement, DeBell releases footage of Jens driving a car in a parking lot. But the reality right now for Jens is practicing his system for hours each day to train his brain to make sense of the phosphenes. Oh yeah, I see where the divider is, eh? And it even looks like it's higher up than the grass is. Now there's a uh, obstruction right over there. For Jens, these little specks of light are just the beginning. When we have candlelight dinners, I can see the candlelight. That's quite meaningful now. It's the little things that you do while you're waiting for the big thing that's called living, and in this case, it's reality. And I'm really happy that I actually have the opportunity now. Sometimes I don't even believe it. What you're seeing here is the beginning of the end of blindness. And it is just the beginning. Even though Jens has only the most basic of vision, other blind people want what he has, and they are coming to Portugal to get it. Gorgeous here in... in uh... It's January of 2003, and Karen and her husband Todd have just arrived in Portugal from the United States. You know, I'll, I'll be taking a step into the unknown here, and um, it is kind of scary. Karen is blind. She has been chosen by scientist William DeBell to be implanted with this radical new artificial vision system. Like thousands of others, Karen had contacted the DeBell Institute after Yen's implant made headlines. Oh, <laughs> oh man. DeBell has reassuring words for the new patients. They're not experimental patients anymore. Uh, this has gone way beyond the early experiments. Remember, I've been doing this for 35 years. These are clinical patients. It's going to change. I mean, you have to but be open-minded But this open -minded is the system I am initially going to get. Yes, but it's going to be replaced. Jens has returned to Portugal, too, yeah. this time as both patient and promoter. I'm getting presently paid by the Nobel Institute to assist in taking care of the media concerns. Surrounded yeah. by the media, Jens goes to work, selling the benefits of the system to Karen. It's a vacation from blindness, and it's something that eventually will be a full-time thing within those five years, because when you pay for this, you're paying for the full five years updates free. And he helps the technicians fine-tune the system by providing valuable feedback from his unique viewpoint. Yeah. Um, no magnification would be as if we covered exactly this distance in the visual field. Yeah. Who is going to be the best mechanic other than the one that test drives your car after you fix it? So you need to test drive it at some point in time to market it. And I basically, I'm test driving the system right now. That's it right there, yeah. If you look at a classical example of a person who lost their leg, it, it, it's not just strap on the prosthesis and run. I mean, it's a long process. Is that a, uh, it's, a small, it's, big it's just actually just an analogy because I happen to know a few people who are in that situation. And it is, it is a serious problem to, to adjust to a prosthesis. So. You see? Yes. You are taller than I thought you were. Oops. But how would I ever have known? All I ever knew you was sitting down. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. It drives me to try even harder now, can you run? to build a smaller, lighter, faster, better system. Because if it has such a remarkable effect on Yens, think of the effect that it could have on all the blind population. The beauty of it is that the first 10% of vision restoration is by far solves 90% of the 
of a person's problems. The one unknown. Karen has an additional problem. She has diabetes. As far as we know, there is no effect of diabetes on the visual cortex, but there might be. Diabetes is the leading cause of newly diagnosed blindness in North America. Karen will be the first diabetic to receive DeBell's implant. For all DeBell's claims, the surgery Karen is about to undergo is experimental. He's never tried this on a diabetic. I know no way to do it in an animal. Uh, we have to do it in a human. Karen is that first diabetic. In just a few moments, she will be wheeled into the operating room. Even in her pre-op drug haze, she's full of hope. Well, I'm gonna be free. Can you imagine <clears throat> being stuck in a cave for a very long while and then coming out? Taking a new breath of fresh air. Along with Dr. John Antunes, Dr. Domingos Coitiero will perform the procedure. This team has performed the implant surgery over 10 times. DeBell says he's hired the best surgeons in the world. The procedure is, is not a complex procedure. The patient is positioned prone, you know, the stomach facing down. Those are the electrodes here. That's the electrode array and the wires connecting to the pedestal. And this is the ground plate that goes beneath the scalp. We do a large incision in the back part of his head. After that, we do what is called a craniotomy. It's just an opening in the bone that will allow you to work through that window. The surgeons drill holes in the skull for the pedestals, the jack where external cables will be plugged into the brain. We attach two pedestals. The pedestals there are connected to the, the electrodes with wires. This is the, the ground plate, and this is the, the electrode array. You don't want for, for a procedure that is in a certain way very experimental. You don't want to have any complications. So definitely the main uh, challenge of this surgery is to implant the, the electrodes and have no complications. We open the dura. The dura is the membrane that covers the brain. And we open that membrane on both sides of the midline. And it's through that opening that we insert the electrodes and then we close everything up. Of course, we have to be very careful about the, the closing because of the main risk of the, the surgery, which is infection, because there is a connection between the inside and the outside. That connection might allow uh, bacteria to go in. She's awake and she's, awake she's talking and moving everything. I am relieved. Uh, I'm sure as hell looking forward to seeing her right now as soon as they let me in. And I'm sure she's going to be sore as we get out. Well, this afternoon, when I got up too fast, I got up too quickly. <clears throat> it was like being hit by a bolt of lightning. Karen has been out of surgery for less than 24 hours. Last night, between the hours of three and four, was the longest hour I've ever spent in my life. Do you want, do you want to help, help down here? Is all the pain and discomfort worth it? Okay. It will be a week before Karen finds out.
At a hospital in Portugal, doctors implant patients with a radical artificial vision system designed by maverick scientist William de Bell. Karen has just received her implant. It will take a week or so before she has recovered enough to test her artificial vision system. Now? No. Now? Yes. While Karen rests, a German patient now? named Klaus is having his system no. tested. Now? No. Next electrode, 52. Now? No. But moments later, the door is closed on Klaus's testing session. No cameras are allowed inside. Something has gone wrong. The Bell Institute staff wait and speculate. It's not going to kill the person. We get scared because it's... What's happening, doctor? Awesome. What happened was the patient had a minor seizure. Um, he remained conscious during the whole thing. It was a pretty minor event. I mean, to us, to you guys, it looks like a you know, big deal. Even though he insists it's a minor event, the bell doesn't know why the seizure happened. You know, we're prepared for anything. This is on the uh, cutting edge, man. <laughs> Sometimes the, the knife comes and cuts you. I mean, remember uh, when the Wright brothers, Orville Wright, took one of the military observers up on a flight, he promptly crashed and killed the military observer. You know, uh, this is a minor event by comparison. Okay. To DeBell, seizure comes with the territory. And I am prepared for the risks of innovation. That's what I do. He is even willing to face the ultimate risk, losing a patient. I certainly would be distressed about it. I know every one of these patients well. But if you can't stand the heat, you get out of the kitchen. But that attitude is not shared by other artificial vision researchers. Dr. Gerald Loeb is director of medical device development at the University of Southern California, and also an early pioneer in electrode development. The epileptic seizures were unexpected, and that's based on uh, research that uh, Dr. Duabell has done himself over 30 years. Uh, the fact that we're seeing those now is an ominous sign. Something has changed. Loeb sees these seizures as serious warning signs. That's some kind of a red flag. The fact that it's not apparently being dealt with as a red flag uh, is very troubling. He points to the importance of rules set out by the FDA in the United States that protect patients from procedures that haven't been proven safe in humans. Those rules are important, and you know, every one of us in the heat of enthusiastic experimentation uh, could well decide to do something uh, that seems wise uh, to us in our enthusiasm, but that really isn't defensible. The stakes are high. The team that first perfects a marketable artificial vision system stands to make millions. The field is crowded with competitors hot on DeBell's heels, like Dick Norman. Norman is working at the University of Utah, DeBell's former school. He believes he is developing an artificial vision system that will be safer and more effective. Unlike DeBell, Norman's research is conducted according to the guidelines of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and is supervised by the university's institutional review board. Unlike DeBell, Norman is perfecting his system first on lab animals. We're very concerned about safety and efficacy of any device that we're going to implant in a human. While DeBell's implant sits on the surface of the brain's visual cortex, Norman's actually penetrates it. In Norman's version, the computer is the size of a palm pilot. The processed video signal is delivered wirelessly to the implant. No wires plug into the skull. Clearly, I think a practical visual prosthesis that would be accepted by people would not have a plug associated with it. Compared to DeBell's, the elements of Norman's system are very small. The electrode array is composed of a large number of micro needles. And the 
tips of these micro needles are very, very sharp. And the diameter of the needle is much smaller than the diameter of a human hair. So this is a very delicate device. Because it's so delicate, Norman's team had to figure out a way to insert it without damaging the device or the brain. Giving the array a very high velocity through a pneumatic insertion system allowed us to literally shoot this array into the brain, which allows us to implant the brain in under 200 microseconds. And in 200 microseconds, the brain doesn't move at all. Just where and how the array or implant is inserted is the key to its success. Normal vision is processed about a millimeter below the surface of the brain. Because you get much more focal stimulation, you can excite neurons with currents which are much smaller than you can with electrodes on the surface of the cortex. This design requires much less power than DeBell's, which means much less chance of seizure. These currents are about a thousand times smaller than the currents that would be required with surface electrodes. So um, these current injections should be much safer uh, than current injections with a surface electrode array. I personally think that penetrating electrodes are extremely dangerous. The occipital lobe may move as a matter of a couple of centimeters uh, if you get hit in the jaw. And uh, uh, the danger is with penetrating electrodes that it'll just rip the cortex. That's a criticism Norman rejects. When the brain pulsates because of blood pressure pulsations or when the brain moves because of respiration, this electrode array just literally floats with the brain. Norman's current model has 100 electrodes, but he says more are needed to create practical vision. We believe that as few as perhaps 650 or 1,000 um, electrodes could provide very useful sight restoration to a blind individual. That would create resolution something like a stadium scoreboard. The more electrodes, the better the resolution. Despite their different approaches, Norman recognizes the value of DeBell's research. I think anybody that has success in this area helps me. His work in the past has advanced the field of artificial vision uh, quite well. And hopefully the work he's doing now will also advance artificial vision. But Norman says he can't comment on DeBell's current work. The only information that I've learned has just been in the media and the lay press. He's not communicated his results in uh, peer-reviewed journals. Um, so I'm really at a bit of a loss to know and to comment on uh, what his successes really are. Jealousy. You know, the scientific community is a very uh, jealous environment. But I don't know why they say that, my God. DeBell hasn't published since Yen's implant, keeping his research secret until he can secure commercial patents. This is a private company, and everything we're doing is proprietary. Everything. But in the scientific world, publishing research findings is the norm. One of the motivation of patients to participate in research is to improve knowledge. And knowledge really isn't knowledge to scientists until it's vetted by other scientists, fully available, and uh, discussed and, and acted upon to advance the field. Around the world, there are at least a dozen other projects to create artificial vision. Hello. Yeah, How are you? Fine, thank you. Uh, OK, good. At the University of Southern California, scientists are trying to restore vision with implants directly on the retina of the eye. And if you, the eye looks really quiet, very little inflammation, if any. Dr. Mark Humayan's team has three patients implanted with permanent retinal chips. Well, the advantage of a device, a microelectronic implant in the retina, is because you can use a lot of the processing that's in the eye. When you go at the brain level, the cortical level, you miss out on that. Also, very importantly, a blind person is more than likely or to let you operate on otherwise blind eye than their normal functioning brains. 
Okay, you can sit back. Connie Showman is one of those three patients. She has retinitis pigmentosa, an inherited condition which destroys the eye's photoreceptors or light-sensing cells, but leaves the rest of the neural circuitry intact. I was first diagnosed when I was 29, and slowly it went downhill until there was no vision at all. I've been totally blind for about 15 years. This is normal vision. This is what vision looks like for a person suffering from retinitis pigmentosa. Eventually, even that tiny window of vision completely disappears. In Humayun's version, a camera mounted on eyeglasses sends a wireless signal to a receiver behind the ear, which transmits the information to the implant in the retina. kind of exciting to get the get to the camera level, huh? It was. It the implant in Connie's eye has only 16 it electrodes. Um, Humayun would like to get that to a thousand. The human brain has an incredible ability to, to use a crude image and make a lot of sense out of it. So even with 16 electrodes, 16 spots of light, our patients can do a lot of things that are mind-boggling. With only 16 electrodes, Humayun is amazed Connie can actually see objects in front of her. But he warns her not to expect too much. Still, she has hopes. Well, it'd be kind of interesting to see my, myself in the mirror. <laughs> or it'd be nice to see my husband. I've actually never seen him. Well, there goes our marriage. <laughs> One look at me and she's gone. <laughs> Back in Lisbon, one week after being implanted with the DeBell artificial vision system, Karen is ready to be tested. Will she see light for the first time in 15 years? It's the moment of truth. Time to test Karen's artificial vision system. She took maybe a week or two longer to heal. I was very concerned about that. But uh, once again, you have to take risks. The technicians are getting now. ready to test whether she sees phosphines. Now? Do you see anything? No. Now? No. Now? Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> indeed. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. That one is no question. It was, um, oh my God. Um, I can't even talk. Um, No, More like a pencil, you know, that, that you wind down a little bit. Oh, that. Okay. Does that make any sense? Yeah, yeah. 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 it's pretty yeah. small, like a small, it's still a pretty small pixel. Yeah. That's good. Karen has just seen her first phosphine, the first light she's seen in 15 years. Over the next hour, she will see many more as the engineers make a map of which of her electrodes seem to be working. So you saw all five of them. Since Karen's testing, DeBell has already implanted a patient with 484 electrodes. That's three and a half times more than Karen's. And as his devices get more sophisticated, DeBell plans to seek FDA approval to sell them in the United States. When I'm confident that I have a product that meets the FDA's criteria, uh, I will submit a PMA and ask for permission to market. Both doctors Humayun and Norman want to see their devices on the market too. I think a clinical device, a device where a blind person could, could literally just go and buy such a system, have it implanted by a neurosurgeon, um, be trained in its use, that time is still probably uh, five years away. Clearly being first will help, but 
being best is what's going to really matter. In the bar at the hotel in Lisbon, patient Alpha, Jens, is the star attraction. He's still a rarity, a man with implants to help him see, a man whose life has changed forever. There's no way I can go back. I cannot go back to the hell of not seeing. As long as there are scientists willing to work on the edge, there will be desperate patients like Jens willing to accept the risks. Anything for that chance to see again. One thing I would still like to be able to see in the future, and I really hope, look forward to that this system becomes more advanced, is to once again fly a small airplane over the Rocky Mountains. Because looking over the Rocky Mountains, in an airplane, maybe 5,000 to 10,000 feet high, is just breathtaking. There's no way to describe it any other way. And a person just has to see that again. Does that cut it? <laughs> All right. <laughs>